Linda Schuyler, treasurer of the League of Women Voters, and want to welcome you all to our, how many is it? Fourth Citizen Engagement Luncheon. Uh, today the topic is Integrity of Journalism, How to Be a Critical Thinking Consumer. Our speakers are the, the husband and wife team of Naomi Shallot and John Christie. Uh, they came from, they started the nonprofit Maine Center for Public Interest Reporting in 2009 because of their concern of this, the status of reporting and also seemingly the lack of public interest reporting. <laughs> um, John is, oh, they, John is currently a consulting editor with the center. He has a long career, 40 year career in journalism. Uh, he's worked as a writer, editor, general manager, and publisher for newspapers owned by Tribune Media, Dow Jones and Company, and the Seattle Times Company. Um, in 2008, he edited the series for I Was Hungry about Hungry in Maine which won a number of awards, including the best editorial series from the National Society of Professional Journalists. Naomi has written for magazines, newspapers around the country, and works as a columnist for the Maine Times, and also was a reporter and producer for Maine Public Radio. <coughs> One of her kudos was an expose on the historic state conservation deal that has gone bad. Currently, she has just become the senior editor of Politics and Society at The Conversation, and perhaps she'll tell us a little bit more of what that really entails. So John and Naomi. Oh, also, before they actually speak, we, wanna, we had some technical difficulties, and we want to recognize two people who worked it through, uh, Beth Roske and John Jose from uh, Orca. Beth is... A, guest here. Thank you. The right place at the right time. <laughs> Before I begin, I'll give a little uh, advertisement for where Naomi is work currently working called The Conversation U.S. This is a, a fascinating organization. Oh, excuse me. This is a, uh, I'll turn it on. Closer. Closer? Really be closer. Okay. Uh, an ad for what Naomi's currently working called The Conversation U.S. Uh, her office is based in Boston. It, it's based on a concept that sort of similar to what we did at the center, but a, a different approach to it, that there's not enough independent, well-researched material in the public uh, media. And a lot of that information in media comes not from journalists, but comes from scholars. So you have people at universities who know a lot about the topics in the news every day, but the problem with those people is that they, they write scholarly pieces that they can understand and the college can understand, but we, the average person, unless it's our, it's, it's our discipline, we don't understand them. So the idea was this organization was invented to make the, leap, the link between the scholars and the public by having people like Naomi work with the scholars on topics, help them write their pieces so that we all can understand them, and then it's given throughout the world in the United States um, to media at no cost, and the AP distributes it. So it's a, it's a wonderful organization that does some of the things that we think really need to be done in journalism. So back to what we're talking about today. Um, to employ was in our president's current words, it is sad <laughs> that we have to begin this talk about integrity of the news by defining what we mean by news these days. Once upon a time, that wasn't something we had to bother with, talking to an informed audience at the league about. We all knew what we meant by news. It was what the newspapers and networks told us happened yesterday. Reporters, trained to be as objective as humanly possible, would venture forth from their newsrooms to a city council meeting, interview with the governor, a scene of a deadly fire, a White House press conference, a battlefield, or maybe even your kid's high school graduation. They would interview people on the scene, maybe gather, go back to the office, make some more phone calls. They would check their facts, they would gather details, and they would sit down and write the story. And then a mean, crusty editor 
would go over this in great detail. That's Ben Bradley, well-known Mean Crusty the editor, looking especially for accuracy and bias, and likely send it back to the reporter for a rewrite. By the time you got it, there was a reasonable explanation that it was reliable and accurate, as much as journalism could be. After all, it was called, journalism is called history written on the run. But then you, you actually knew what was happening. Now, we live by a motto in journalism, with two models I'm going to give you. The first one was in that subtitle. It said, um, what about the first slide? Just for a second. If your mother tells you she loves you. This is when we go in journalism classes. We have young students in, in class, or beginning reporters, and I say to them, look, at, uh, when you go home tonight and your mother says, I love you, what are you going to do? And their answer usually says, well, I'm going to tell my mother I love you also. No, I say, that's the wrong answer. The right answer is you're going to check it out. <laughs> so that was, that was the way we lived journalism for a long time. I can't tell you precisely when this began to change, but I believe the roots of our current state of journalism began with cable news and the sudden ability of the media to get ratings and learn what kind of stories, what kind of headlines, what kind of visuals got the biggest audience and thus the best advertising rates. <coughs> now, you might, anybody back in the 70s, 80s, live in the Boston metro area, listen to W, I think it was Channel, um, it was channel 5, you know, they, those are the guys that invented the phrase we all know right now, but if it bleeds, it leads. So if, it, if it's exciting, put it on first, because they found out that sort of news and all the sort of cheap news is what got ratings. But in the newspaper business, we never had the ability to know that for the longest, longest time, hundreds of years. All we could do was guess which story sold more newspapers than the other. I, come, I would talk to my circulation director and I'd say, uh, how did that big story about uh, city council do? We sell a lot of extra papers yesterday, uh, Tom? Tim's name was Tim. He said, I don't know, John. I don't, won't know for a week till we get the returns back from the stores. So a week later, I'd say, well, we got back uh, fewer returns than usual that day. But it might have been because it was a sunny day and more people were out in the street that day. And the previous Tuesday was raining. So I can't really tell you if that story told. OK, we'll decide. We won't really worry about which stories sell papers because, frankly, this idea that we want to sell newspapers with big stories was ridiculous to begin with. You want to know why? Most newspapers are pre-sold they were, at least, before you saw it was in them, because you got what? Home delivery. So it, it didn't really matter. So you had some papers still the newsstand. The, the average newspaper would sell 80% of its newspapers by home delivery, and 20% of the newsstand. Of those 20%, almost all of them did it automatically. So the idea of we would have a big headline, we sell a lot of papers. You know how many papers we'd sell extra? 50, 60, 120 papers. It's nothing because that's a few pennies. So we, we really weren't oriented towards it bleeds, it leads, try to have a hot story on there and sell it. And then what happened? We got the web and the internet. And after a while, we found out we could, which story actually got you to look at it, which was kind of bad news for journalism. <laughs> because rather than having those people that crush the editor and his experienced reporters who were trained in journalism, make decisions about what the news is, we started worrying about what you wanted to see. And at the same time, we were hurting on a business basis. I want to show that slide. So this shows you what's happened to the circulation of newspapers during that period of time. It's gone down a whole lot. Now circulation, a little, a little lesson in newspapering. Circulation is not the number of people who read the paper. It's the number of people who buy the paper. So just for your information, background on the inside the newspaper business, if there's one paper sold, there's 2.3 readers. That's the rule. Any case, it's going down. The economy paid circulation or readership. I mean, you're going to say to yourself, yeah, but I understand the readership online's gone way up. It, it replaced some of that for a while. Now it's going back down again. The most latest stats show that in, in I think it was in 17, we, the business had fewer online readers than in 2016. Probably because they can go other places. Probably because it's topped out. So the business is going down. The other chart shows you the number of newspapers in the country, daily newspapers. So we have fewer newspapers and fewer people are reading them. And when you take into account the growth in population in the United States in the last 100 years, it's even a worse story. So here we are, losing readers, losing advertisers, at the same time, we can discover how to make people happy with our stuff by giving them more of what they want. 
Thus, we have the decline in newspapering business and why a lot of the news uh, looks so cheap to you. In the old days, um, you know, we thought the most important thing was to get it right first. And if we couldn't get it right, we waited. But we've discovered now that getting it wrong first really still gets you clicks, still gets you clickbait. So no one, we, we have ethics that say we're worried about these things, but we don't really care about them that much. I go back to what I consider uh, another really important point in journalism that happened. Who remembers Richard Jewell? Okay, when I tell you who he is, you remember. I, uh, this was the 96 Olympics, 1996 Olympics, and there was a bombing there. And Richard Jewell was a security guy. And somebody in, in, the, in the police department said, this guy, we're thinking about him as a possibility. And then and the Atlantic Constitution and everybody else ran with Richard Jewell. Here's his picture. He was not a good-looking guy. He's kind of a chubby guy, kind of looked like a loser, hanging around, didn't have a good background. Suddenly, Richard Jewell was the bomber in the Olympics. It wasn't Richard Jewell. It was a complete mistake. We took these anonymous sources. We exaggerated them. We got a lot of attention. What happened to poor Richard Jewell? The, 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 uh, the, I think the Atlanta Constitution apologized. And he died at age 44. I think all he got was an apology. Uh, I want to mention a little bit. Uh, you know, it was it was uh, it's, right now people won't, people at the same time this Trump phenomena has exaggerated and almost put a supercharge on what's wrong with the media. So now, besides all the problems where we're we're doing things to get clicks, we're not checking things out. We're trying to be first, no matter if we're right or not. At the same time, along comes this Trump phenomenon, and everybody is even more polarized than they ever were before, even more interested in only getting news that they agree with. And even, even if the newspaper tries to do its job that it always wanted to do, it gets into trouble. The New York Times this year ran a fascinating profile of a man in the Midwest who was a young guy, a regular kind of guy, who became a very big follower of the American Nazi movement. And this story detailed who he was and why he got to be there. It really was very insightful, and it really made the point really clearly in a paragraph way at the top that being a Nazi is not a good thing. It's a bad thing. That the Times wasn't endorsing Nazism or an American version of it. It was just trying to expose it and do its job. Well, the New York Times comment place went wild. People, I'm going to cancel my subscription. The New York Times shouldn't be writing about this. They shouldn't be telling us this. They should be ignoring this. So. Even New York Times writers, readers rather, wanted news that didn't upset their point of view of the world. And that's another problem that we've got with journalism right now. So Naomi's going to cop up and tell you a few things, too. And I'll come back. Um, just what, oh boy, you really can't see what's up on the screen. Um, the reason we're talking to you about what journalism Would is. Would you speak into the microphone? Well, thank you. The reason we're talking to you today about what journalism is and isn't is because in order for you to be good citizens, to be, you need to be good consumers of news. You need to be able to recognize when it's news that has integrity and when it's not. And so that's why we're giving you this um, lesson in news you today. Need to be closer to the um, I'm as you close as I can, but you I can lift it out. Yeah. And pull it right up to your mouth. Yeah. I I don't think it's working. Well, yeah. Yeah. Is it? Oh, gosh. All right. I have to. Yeah. So so this is you know you sitting at your computer at home, looking at what the news is, except maybe it's fake news. So this is what we're trying to help you with is is ways to to um, identify what's real, what has integrity, what, what is ethical journalism, and what isn't. Um, so um, all these changes that John has been talking about mean that the onus for trustworthy news has essentially switched from the producers of news to you, the consumers of news. So first thing you need to do is something that is getting to be more and more of a problem, and that is recognize Next slide, John. Um, okay. When news figures are opinionating and not informing. 
So in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when, what we consider that more pure age of journalism when professionalism meant objectivity and independence, you didn't know what the nightly news anchors thought about the news. They were responsible and sober about presenting the news, and little, if any, opinion crept into the news. Now we have people who are in the role of anchor who have decided, or their superiors have decided, to grant themselves a second role, which is essentially to editorialize. So Rachel, when we first did this talk, we put up Rachel Maddow and we put up Sean Hannity, because they were kind of um, the eg real examples of, of what we were talking about. Um, but what's happening now is if you look at CNN, if you look at MSNBC, if you look at any number of other stations, if you look at your news on TV, um, for example, um, even Jake Tapper, who we love and think is a great TV reporter, but there, he's now showing his exasperation and anger on the air and on Twitter, opinionating about the Trump administration. So what you've got is people who call themselves news people, but really they're, they're editorialists, um, or they're part editorialists and part news people. And these people are damaging journalism, which is supposed to give you the facts and then let you decide how you feel and what you think about it. It even shows up in what you might consider innocent ways. So Wolf Blitzer describing a chemical attack on Syrian citizens as terrible. It's not his job to describe it. Just describe the chemical attack. And guess what? You guys are smart enough to know that killing people with chemical weapons is horrible. You don't need to be told it's terrible, do you? You wouldn't go out and say, oh, this great thing happened in Syria. They just killed a lot of babies and moms and dads with chemical weapons. So um, it may seem innocuous, but it's one more step towards shading the news and compromising the integrity of journalists and journalism. So why is this a problem? Because the American public needs to have faith that the news they are getting is free of either fear or favor. Because guess what happens if it isn't? You are vulnerable to charges in the news business of fake news. The news needs to be credible. It's what we base our opinions on about our political leaders and institutions. Journalism itself is a civic institution that should inform the public and should leave the opinion making to the citizens who read or watch or listen to it. Many of you, we suspect, are suspicious of the credibility of news that you see on the Fox channel because you believe ideology colors, slants, shifts their presentation of the facts. But to be a responsible citizen, you should also approach the news that's on NPR, where I worked, um, MSNBC, I worked at a state affiliate of NPR, CNN, with a similarly skeptical eye. <coughs> Television news often, shows often feature panels of people commenting on the latest breaking news. It's a way of filling up time in the 24-hour news cycle that is voracious. It's a way of entertaining viewers because it's kind of you get sometimes you get real food fights um, on these, and perhaps it's also a way of informing the public about current events. By appearing on a news program, the people on the panels enjoy a degree of credibility that they may not deserve. You should take the time, you, to understand who these people are and why they may be saying the things they do. So when you have a former top aide to a president, a former campaign manager on a presidential campaign, these are people with a dog in the fight. They're not going to give you an objective, independent analysis. I mean, you know, if you want to hear what hacks think about something that's happening, listen to them, but recognize that this is not an independent analysis um, of what's happening. These are surrogates, analysts with a particular point of view, and journalists who are not supposed to have a point of view also sometimes occupy these, uh, the seats in these um, panels. But there's something that even happens to the journalists some of them, which is things get so heated up that the journalists kind of compete in heating it up, too, because they feel boring and kind of minor when they're not in the dogfight as well. Um, figure out who among these people is the rare independent analyst 
who will give you sober and unbiased analysis, and then listen to the opinionating um, and uh, by a different journalist on the panel, and remember it the next time they present a supposedly objective report on the news. So, news that has integrity may not look as exciting as the junk food news. It's just, you know, Judy Woodruff and some guy, and they're having a sober discussion, and it's not, you know, it doesn't have, like, breaking news all over it, but you'll learn something. With all the bells, whistles, virtual reality videos, entertaining and opinionating featured in today's news, the stuff that's good for you, the straight news that informs rather than titillates, looks kind of boring. But treasure it the way you would treasure a well-worn and useful vintage tool that is simply made handy and which you still use every day. Um, PBS NewsHour is still living up to the standards of quality independent journalism, and the rest is often just a cheap thrill. So next, beware hidden bias in choice and slant of stories. So it's not just the content of the story, but it's the slant um, of the story. So even with a highly respected NPR, there's a foundational belief among reporters, editors, and producers that any program, any government program or nonprofit advocacy program designed to help people, that claims to help people, is good. And these people that are being helped are almost universally referred to as the vulnerable. As the what? The vulnerable. You hear it all the time. Um, it's code for, we should feel sorry for these people, slightly condescending towards them, and good that we want to help them. And I think, as I've spent a lot of time reporting on poverty, um, in uh, Maine especially, um, I think it is a terrible thing to do as a reporter because you do not grant agency to the people who you're describing. They're just this, this sort of passive group of sad sacks who need our help rather than real people who have ideas and opinions and may actually not like being called the vulnerable. Um, so any reporting about expanding programs for the vulnerable is done in a positive tone. Any story about contraction has a negative tone. This goes back to this unfortunate idea that's crept into journalism of, quote, afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. That concept does not coexist well with the much greater principle that journalists much heed, must heed, which is to be independent. And there's a practical side to why afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted is a bad idea. While it may be a good principle to follow if you're an advocate, if you go out to report on a story with that mission driving you, you're likely to miss things because you've already decided what the story's about. And you're just looking for things that support that picture in your mind. You won't truly be able to open yourself to what is happening in front of you. I think this was very much the case in this last national election um, when Trump got elected. All of a sudden, people woke up and said, oh, wow, there's this whole part of the country that we've just kind of labeled as something but not paid attention to. And we don't really know what they think and who they are. But we did decide that they were voting against their self-interest. So here's an example from a main paper, a story about how 1,000 calls per month, so you divide 12,198 by 12, um, 1,000 calls per month were going unanswered at the state's child abuse hotline. That's not good, right? Kids are getting hurt. It's being ignored. But what you only learn much lower down in the story is that that's actually a 33% improvement over the previous year when 1,500 calls per month were not being answered, and that the state had instituted a program since then to diminish the number of a unanswered calls. But, and this is key, it's harder to see the slant and bias when you agree with it. So in fact, this was part of a series of stories done by the BDN that were pretty much trashing every initiative out of the state's department of um, effectively health and human services. Um, conservative was running it, deputized by conservative Governor Paul LePage. 
to you know really rein some programs that represented a huge part of the state um, budget to rein them in and and ipso facto everything they did was going to be bad when in fact in some cases it wasn't this case is one example the growth in conservative media is to a degree a response to this kind of thing the lack of understanding and presentation of the working and business person's point of view for example has led as we saw in the last presidential election to an appetite for a different perspective in the news in these times would say they represented the working person's point of view as would mother jones where i did work but the working person wouldn't necessarily have said that okay do you want to go to spj now john mm -hmm. okay here we go you were better at talking into this than i was Okay. Yeah, you, you would think that it was this complicated thing to know what to do as a journalist, you know, because of all the things you've heard, all, all the things you see. It's not complicated. We've actually figured it out. There's an organization, a professional organization, the Society of Professional Journalists, that tells you, and after doing research, how to behave, how to do things. And newspapers violate this all the time. I don't, many of you are professionals, I'm sure. And you have a professional code of ethics that you probably take seriously, you get in trouble. Well, journalism isn't regulated, nor, nor should it be, in my opinion. But we can self-regulate. And some of these things just have to be paid, paid attention to. I'm not even sure journalists are always learning about them anymore. The biggest one is, is verify. I mean, this is the first thing we're told. Verify. Get it right. Don't publish it till you know what's right. Anybody remember the coverage of the, of the uh, Marathon Bomber on television? I mean, it was wrong all the time because they heard something from somebody via Twitter or a guy who knew a guy, and they put it out there. I know that um, there was a bombing afterwards at the Naval Yard in Washington, D.C., in which um, it was the New York Times, I think, that gold Adam worked for at the time. And um, he got the actual identification of the person who did it wrong. And we talked to him about it. He explained what happened. He said, well, I got it from two sources, so I thought I was right. Well, one source got it from the other source. That's bad journalism. And both of them were, and here's the biggest problem in journalism right now. Well, I'm saying they're all big problems, but it's a big one. Anonymous sources. Okay. You know what that means? In the story or on television, they don't tell you where the information came from. Trump is going to fire some. The mayor is going to do this. Uh, the Pentagon is going to do that. Whatever it may be, according to sources, according to sources, according to my sources. Will Blitzer says, "Have you worked your sources?" Yes, I've worked my sources. Never, never naming the source. That's anonymous sourcing. What's wrong with anonymous sourcing? You have no idea if the person exists, or if the person you got it from actually thought to somebody else who got it wrong to begin with. Or they have a bias. Or they have a, an axe to grind. You can believe that most of the stuff coming out of the White House, it's all anonymous sources right now, are people who want another result by putting down this guy or bringing up that person. But we have rules about it. Our rule says not to use the, uh, the anonymous sources except in the rare case where they may face danger. Very rare does that happen if someone's facing danger by giving information. Or retribution. I don't see a lot of retribution going on about people leaking stuff out of the White House or the State House or any place else. There's hardly any retribution going on. Um, well, you Stormy can't. Daniels. What's that? Stormy Daniels. Stormy Daniels. She's not. She's not in trouble. She can't get fired, and she's not an anonymous source. But she's been threatened. She's well, but but she's not an anonymous source. The question is about anonymous sources. They can get threatened, but there's something having happened. This used to have anonymous sources. I've had anonymous sources very, very rarely. Uh, Woodward and Bernstein had some anonymous sources, but they checked it out multiple times. It was the rare case where we had to have anonymous sources. Now, almost every story you'll see on politics and government relies on multiple anonymous sources, and the only thing they'll tell you about them, you get the guy, the picture of the guy? There you go. This is anonymous source. <laughs> uh, is that he doesn't want to be identified. He's, it's an anonymous source, says the New York Times, or the Washington Post, or any newspaper you could think of, or, or any television. He's an anonymous source because he wants to be an anonymous source. Basically, they say he asked not to be identified because he has no right to talk about it. He's not authorized to talk about it. That's not a legitimate reason for being an author, uh, anonymous source. He's not facing danger or retribution. 
He just wasn't supposed to talk about it. He says he probably could talk about it. He probably was authorized to talk about it. But it's a game everybody's playing, and we're the victims of that game. You know, there was a time when we took this problem seriously. In 2004, the New York Times had a public editor, Daniel Orkert. Right, right pronunciation? Orkert. Oh, Orkert. Oh, yep. And he said, and he now, was at the. Explain what the public editor is. The public editor would be the person at the, at the newspaper, I'll we'll call the ombudsman also, who critiques the newspaper. The newspaper has had enough courage and confidence to hire some in, in their own organization to be independent to critique the newspaper. And it was called the public editor of the New York Times. And this is what uh, Oakert said. This is in 04, and it's just gotten worse. The hunger for scoops, even in the quietest of times, newspaper people live to be first. When a story as momentous as this one comes into view, I don't know who he's talking about, because I don't remember what it was. Uh, Iraq, was Iraq, right. When caution and doubt could not be more necessary, they can instead be drowned in a flood of adrenaline. One old Times hand recently told me there was a period in the not too distant future when editors stressed the maxim, don't get it first, get it right. That's mutated into get it first and get it right. The next devolution was an obvious one, just get it first. And this is where this is the this is where the weapons of mass destruction, and the reporter from the Times, who got all the anonymous sources that told that they that 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 Hussein had them, that got us into war, that turned out to be wrong. That's what's wrong with anonymous sources. We uh, the Times then had another editor, uh, Margaret Sullivan. Uh, was there also, and she was a public editor until a few years ago. They don't have one now. The Times just got rid of that job. No one's critiquing the Times. Uh, the Washington Post had one too. I don't think they've got one anymore. I don't think anybody's doing this. We're cutting back staffs, and we're cutting back the people on the staff that keep us honest. Uh, we had uh, the, the, the Bannon piece. Uh, this piece was uh, uh, some of the Times also. But behind the scenes, White House officials said the, ideolo the ideologists who enjoyed the President's conference became increasingly embattled as other advisors, including Mr. Trump's daughter and son-in-law, complained about setbacks in health care and immigration. Lately, Mr. Bannon has been conspicuously, ab conspicuously absent from some meetings, and now he's lost his seat at the national security table. A move that was widely seen as a sign of changing fortune, Mr. Trump removed Bannon from one of his principal's committee. That was all also anonymous sources. And eventually, Bannon got removed but probably because someone planted that story with the New York Times. The SPJ editor said about well, all this thing, because he, he's taking it very seriously, and this was a few years ago. He said, this might be the worst collapse of journalism standards we've seen in 50 years. Thanks to the 24-hour news cycle, social media, and the uncontrollable urge to be the first to report, this has created a wrecking ball in our ethics. And Sullivan, the public editor of the Times, wrote, I don't feel so good. This was, I think this was her last column. I don't feel so good about not being able to investigate every complaint or about failing to make a dent in long-time problems like the overuse of anonymous sources. And then she quoted a reader from Vermont, David Steinhardt, ring any bells? Who told her, who complained to her about the pointless blind quotes, anonymous quotes, from government officials that can easily serve to mask unaccountable <clears throat> half-truths and lies. I beseech the Times not to facilitate government acting like the Wizard of Oz behind a curtain when even stated reasons for doing so make no imaginable sense. Sullivan responded, readers are right to protest when they see anonymity granted gratuitously. That's happening too often. It's time once again to pull in the reins. I've written about this from time to time, and as have my predecessors, but the little or no avail. The Times, when they got called on a carpet about this by Margaret Sullivan, would say, oh, yeah, yeah, we violated our policy that time, but a good reason we won't do it again. And they would do it again. And then she complained, and they would do it again. And I'm not against the New York Times. It's a great newspaper. They do so much good stuff. But when it's their self-interest to violate their own policies, the policies of our own organization, it's in their self-interest, either for business reasons or political reasons, they're very, very happy to do it. You can tell that's not from an American source because it's not learned. It's learned. Um, but I thought that was a useful slide. So we're, a little bit of talk about confirmation bias. Um, does anybody know what that is? 
you get data that confirms your point of view and therefore the data must be right. Yeah, yeah. So do not believe shoddy reporting just because it confirms your biases. But you say the New York Times reported it. But you say Bannon and Trump are evil people, so of course the story sounds right. But sounds right is not a basis for reporting something as fact. As a responsible news reader, listener, or watcher, you may need you need to be aware of your own biases and how they can make you nobody in here, but how they make people lazy, <laughs> uncritical news consumers. And then you need to distinguish between opinion and fact. Okay, this is really I, I love this slide. Um, take, the, take the mic with you. I'll take the mic with me. Thank you. I don't know how far it goes, but. So this is the homepage of the New York Times online, okay? And on this homepage, okay, it's nice, you know it's the New York Times, all the news that, that's fit to print. Here is a news story. Okay, this is not the whole news page, it goes. Here is another news story, and they've taken to having a huge um, photo in the middle every day. And then over on this side, what does it say at the top there in tiny little print? Opinion. Opinion. Okay, it used to be opinion was on a different page, okay? You open the newspaper, a hard copy, the opinion's at the back, which is where John was the publisher, I was his opinion page editor at, at two newspapers in Maine. The opinion page was way at the back of the news because that's where it belonged, okay? Here, opinion is elevated to the level of news. And it's meaningful that this is what the geography of the nation's most vaunted <coughs> newspaper looks I like. I read a digital version of the New York Times, and I, is it on that too? Is it yes. Yeah, right? yeah, this is the digital oh version. God. Yeah. Wow. See, and you're not even aware of it, yeah. okay? So, beware of Devin Nunes' next move. Now, that's an opinion headline, but it's up here with Democrats win in Pennsylvania, upends parties' midterm plans. So think about this when you're looking at, at um, online sources. Distinguish between opinion and fact. And I'll tell you where I'm working now at the conversation. We do not allow a scholar to state a single fact, even that it rained on Thursday, without linking to a source so you can confirm that. And that's what you really should be looking for. Is very, there's way too much opinion in the world. Stop reading as much of it as you do and keep reading the news. Um, so, knowing the difference between opinion and fact, certainly it's labeled usually as opinion, but you will find opinion showing up in news, um, in the news side as well. Um, and I think the other thing um, to understand is that a lot of the world doesn't make this distinction. So you'll have your friends saying, no, 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 I know this is true because I read it again in the Times or whatever, and then you have to challenge them and say, was that an interpretation or was that an actual fact? So I think we go right back to you. This is my short time up here, John. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Yeah, 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 we'll get to yeah. yeah, when I, when, I, when I was a reporter, uh, and I've been a reporter covering politics since the 1970s, maybe 69, uh, in Boston and, and, and in Florida and in New York. You know, generally, the way things happened was if a politician had some news, they put out a press release, they had a press conference, and reporters went to it, and we came back, and we wrote a story, we got all the sides of the story, and went out there. The politicians, the public officials, really, really needed the newspaper to get the story out which they weren't very happy about, but they couldn't do anything about it until along came this darn thing we're talking about today, the internet. And they could decide, we don't need the news newspapers anymore to put out news, we'll put out our own news. And they, so they made things that look like the news. Which one is that, it's the main wire? It's the main wire. Yeah, I will use a main example. The main wire, oh, do uh, you know, everybody knows what wire means? The, new, the news business? Way, way back when, the Associated Press and the U UPI, the UPI, the oh, Press International, the they were called, for short, they were called the wire because the news came over a literal wire. Uh, so for, for news people, the wire is a really important old fashioned phrase that means legitimate news. So they call themselves the main wire, making themselves sound legitimate. It is strictly, and it looks like news. It looks like, and you can, you can get a bunch of these from Democratic groups, from Republican groups, from conservative groups. 
they all could go on. They, in the past, to have a newspaper, you had to have a big darn press. And a press would cost you anywhere from three to $15 million and cost you thousands of dollars a week to run. And paper would cost you tens of thousands of dollars a year to get. That's how you had a newspaper. That's how you get the news out. With this, you don't need any of that stuff. You need some guy with a computer who knows how to set up a website. And then you make up stuff, or put your press releases out and act like they're news. So, and a lot of people now either go there knowing it's the news they want, it's from the Republican Party, or they Google something, a couple words, it shows up in the main wire, sounds like a newspaper to me, main wire, sounds like main news, I will believe it. So news, what's happened is politicians, and this is getting tough for reporters now in a lot of places, they're cutting us out of what, what's going, we used to go to a public official, now they didn't talk to you, it was hell to pay, you know. We put in, Senator John Martin refused to talk to the paper. Well, next day he talked to you because he was pretty embarrassed about that. Now, no problem, he doesn't need to talk to us anymore. He's got his own press release operation, he's got his own website. We can be cut out completely so they're not being held accountable by real reporters because they can go out there and get it done themselves. And then this could be the main wire. We have one in Maine called the Maine Beacon. That's the Democratic Party. Uh, we have Common Dreams. That's uh, a mostly a liberal site. We have the Daily Cause, very much uh, another very uh, liberal site. But there's, there's, there's many of them. I, I got a quote from uh, the Daily Cause. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Yeah. K-O-S. Uh, Neil Gorich was, will serve the rest of his life on this quote with an asterisk by his name. The associate justice who was appointed by a traitor will help from a complete will help from a completely corrupt Republican Party. Will get help from. So I mean, that, you may agree with that point of view. It may be correct, but it, it's being presented as news that someone's a traitor, that that a party is corrupt, not opinion, but as news, and it comes that way because it looks it looks it looks right to to you. And I could find examples from the other side just as easily. Uh, the main wire is, has lots of them. Uh, We hope that our talk, and we're going to talk a little bit about fake news in a minute, but we'll, 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 we'll end with this in a second. We hope that our talk has given you an understanding of what news is and what news isn't, and how to read it, watch it, and listen to it responsibly. Okay, we have one alternative, though, if all that fails you. Okay? This is what one day when it was tough on Naomi, what she did when we were watching the news. <laughs> <laughs> so we're glad to take some questions, and, I, uh, and uh, particularly if you have any more about fake news, I've got a few tips to share. Yeah, and actually, on the table and back there, um, on the media, which is a pretty good program out of WNYC, um, did a breaking news consumer's handbook. And it's it just put it up on your fridge. Um, you can find it online. And things like um, big red flags for fake news, all caps. OK, that'll give you. Or um, check the domain. This is a very useful one. Fake sites often add dot co to trusted brands to steal their um, legitimacy. So abcnews.com.co. Um, so this is a, a checklist to help you recognize um, fake news. So questions? Louder. What you hear, you know, what you're hearing on the news, fake or otherwise. But then there's a the question of what you don't hear. And I think uh, early in the campaign, um, Trump is getting mentioned you know, like 30 times as much as Bernie Sanders. So the news was leaving out some significant things, at least significant to the commenters. But, but I think significant to everyone. Yeah, we, we were watching a lot at that time, and, 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 and I think it was... Please repeat the uh, question. Uh, sorry. Uh, the question is, what are you not hearing in the news? What are you missing? And, and Trump got a lot of attention, and Bernie Sanders did not in the early part of the campaign. And the uh, head of CNN, I think, regretted it afterwards. Explain why. They were making a ton of money off Trump. Trump's going to be on in, in, in 10 minutes. Everybody, he's going to say something wild, crazy. We, they didn't say that, but you knew it. So he got attention, he got ratings, they kept putting him on. Um, I don't believe, because I think CNN right now is really trying to, trying to defeat Trump, clearly, and, and it's, it's obvious with their, with their eye rolling every time they mention his name, what they think. But at the time, they didn't think they were creating a monster, uh, but they did. We felt the same way with the Times. Uh, we felt that, um, and we have no 
we're really disinterested in who wins. I don't really care who wins. I'm a, I'm a journalist. I have no interest in who wins the campaign. I just want to cover it. That very similarly with the, on the Democratic side, I think Clinton was getting much, much more headlines and better display, which on page one, and Bernie was getting fewer stories, Sanders, another friend of mine, on page 11. And but at the same time, we were watching the polls and the results of the primaries, and it was a, it was a darn close thing going on, but the Times wasn't, and we use the Times because it's a national news, we use other papers, we weren't recognizing that. So I think there was some, I believe there was business interest that got Trump the attention in the TV case, and then some bias, I think, in print case, and also a belief by reporters because they think they know more than anybody else. The flip ah, he doesn't have a chance. Bernie doesn't have a chance. Put him on page eleven. Oh, we want something. Ah, he's doing well in the polls. Ah, it's, Hillary's going to win. We all know Hillary's going to win, and that they they they, they it was self fulfilling, in my opinion. Uh, two points. One is that um, I, I do watch the uh, both PBS News Hour and I listen to NPR. Yes, here I am on the political spectrum. <laughs> and um, Judy has begun uh, throwing in editorial comments uh, uh, at the end of the story. And I just want to tell you, shut up and report the news. <laughs> so um, it, it's creeping into the news hour. The other thing I've noticed is that NPR is uh, reporting more stories from the right. Um, it could just be my... Uh, hackles in my observation, but it, it seems to me that NPR is doing um, a, a, making a better effort of reporting, uh, doing a very good effort of, of reporting from the right. Judy's doing an effort of, of, of um, editorializing. The other thing that constantly baffles me is that, is the, the news um, effort to, uh, both in print and, and uh, live media, to ask, what do people think will happen? And I thought you guys were supposed to report what did happen. Yes, right. And right. why the focus on, and what do you think is going to happen? What, where did that come from? So, you you so, want to give this talk because you got you got it down. Yeah. you got it down. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, Elizabeth. So, so what Elizabeth was saying was that two things, um, she said one of them was watching um, PBS NewsHour Judy Woodruff's go um, more emotional um, and, and, more, and, and less um, independent. Um, and NPR uh, bringing in more stories from a um, right orientation. There's a reason NPR is doing that, that you'd like to think it was just virtue. But it's also, they got caught. One of their um, top people was taped by that dreadful man, I can't remember what his name is, um, uh, who was right here. An Irish guy. name, I know that. Yes, uh, O'Neill uh, or oh, something. Bailey, O'Keefe, O'Keefe, James O'Keefe. And they were taped um, talking to someone saying very clearly, we don't like the right wing, we're, we're progressive journalists and that's where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. And so they got shamed into that as much as anything else. Um, I, you know, let's hope it sticks. Um, but uh, so there's that. And then um, what was the second part? Why don't they report the news? Why well, they keep asking oh, us what's yeah, going to happen? Yeah, well, because they're, 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 they're filling up 24 hours a day. Yeah. And um, you, can't, you can't fill up um, with the news all the time. You go to rank speculation. And people like it. Because again, people are watching for their confirmation biases. So they can you know, score one for that side or score one. I think there's, there's also um, something else that has gone on that we haven't talked about, which is it used to be if it bleeds, it leads. It's now if it's Trump, it leads. If it's politics, if it's Devin Nunes, it leads. If it's this or that. There, there is more to our civic life together, to our citizens' lives, than just what's going on in the White House. There's, there's state government. There's federal government. There's the Agriculture Department, and not just what the table is that somebody bought, but real things, real policies. And you just don't see that anymore. When we started um, the center in Maine, it, there were five reporters covering the State House, and they just covered kind of the State House. 20 years before, there were 20 reporters in Maine covering government. There was somebody who just covered DHHS, the Health and Human Services. There was somebody who just covered marine fisheries. There, and you have lost all of that. 
and basically ended up with kind of the cheap whoring after the, the you know, they're so glad that LePage is governor because he gets clicks, he gets um, uh, page views. And so I think the degradation of our civic lives is also being, um, being you know, fed by the fact that we don't know enough about what government is doing anymore. We know what politics, what's happening in politics. We don't know what's happening in government. Yeah. It seems to me that the news media is being uh, led by the nose by our current president who manages to capture every day and draw attention to himself through his Twitter feeds. And if, whether it's newsworthy or not, it's like moss to the candle flame. Uh, and where, where do you folks draw the line? Well, I think, I think we would draw the line on whether it's going to impact people significantly, whether it's, whether it's just him talking to get attention or actually as a policy implication. So I, and a lot of journalists have talked about this. Some have proposed that there'd be much more judgment applied to everything Trump does and to make some kind of dividing line between what's substantial and what's basically Trump is stand-up comedian. But the problem is the stand-up comedian stuff, sometimes it's a joke, sometimes it isn't a joke, sometimes he says it was a joke to see what it meant. And, and, and he's, you know, he's deliberately monopolized. Yeah, deliberately, sure, absolutely. So he's running for 2020 right. just by and, doing that. And it gets everybody's attention. Yes. So there's a business uh, aspect to this that we forget journalism is a business. And there's nothing wrong with that. If we don't make money, we can't cover the news. But it's gotten out of hand. The judgment's gone. And I, I really tell you right now, newspapers are dying. The spray press is dying. The Austin paper just got sold. The Chicago Tribune, where I work, just cut off a bunch of people again. What was the third one of the day that it happened? It was the Denver Post. Denver Post is laying off people. There, the, there are newspapers that 15 years ago had 350 people in the newsroom, one that I worked for. It's now 35 and going down. This woman here. Um, I'm often really frustrated when I'm trying to research a topic. And I even go, like, when I go to any, even like, you know, big newspapers, any articles at all. And I'm looking for citations, and they say studies show this and this. And then there's not like any kind of clue as to what the study was, who conducted the study, like nothing like that. And I'm really frustrated by that. And I was wondering, if, is, that, is there like some policy or, or any kind of protocol that, the, that real reporters are supposed to follow to cite that? Because it doesn't seem right that you can just say that. Well, you know, so studies show shows up in a lot of stories and you can't click on what those studies are. And you, so you don't know whether the study was by the Brookings Institution, which is generally a liberal place, or the Heritage Policy Center, uh, or the, uh, whatever it is, um, in, and the Reason Institute, and the Cato Institute, and you name it. Because what's happened, um, along with this fracturing of the news business and, and getting news with opinion sites is you've also gotten got more and more of these um, nonprofit foundations that produce study after study to support um, the, uh, the one political point of view or another. There, a good journalist would, if they um, had the time, would cite the study. And you will see more and more, I've been hearing, they will label the liberal Brookings Institution, the liberal Center for American Budget and Policy Priorities, the right wing or the conservative whatever. So that helps you a little bit. But, you know, we, we had a, a wonderful news intern work for us. She was actually our first fellow who went on to work for what used to be great newspaper group in, uh, was it the record? Yeah, Brookings yeah. Record. In, in northern New Jersey. She had to cover five towns five towns worth of planning commissions, worth of board of education, worth of city councils, and you can't possibly take the time to find the study, let alone label it and type the URL in. Um, it's, it's triage for so many. Um, I would say that when you have real complaints, let the news um, organization know. 
You really should. It will help, maybe, I don't know, but it may get their attention. It's better than going down without fighting. Uh, I'll just add, I'll the organization Airman I founded and the one she works for currently, both of them, the policy was cite the study and have a URL and click to it. That's the right way to do it. Lady in blue over there. The information um, that is out there that sells newspapers, that uh, gets Nelson ratings, that is happening big time, but it ruins journalism, just absolutely destroys it. And it's being done as if it's journalism. When is journalism going to take back its name? When is journalism going to take back journalism? I have the same attitude. I, my attitude is I'd rather go down fighting uh, and lose journalism than do it this lousy, terrible, awful way we're doing it. And I don't, it's not going to happen because the, the, the numbers aren't good for us. Uh, you paint a picture um, describing the deficiencies of the news they, they, as if it were perk in the past. But there's always been yellow journalism. There's, I mean, McCarthy never would have gotten as far as he did if he hadn't had certain news uh, papers breathing uh, fire and whatnot. And there have always been news mag. You know, there was the Buckley's Magazine and the New Republic. And you know, some of us were able to sort that out. Some people weren't. But I don't see that the major news sources, even with their deficiencies are so much worse than what we've had in the past if you look back. The big problem is that there's a whole generation that doesn't even look at the New York Times online for their news. Um, and they're going to be voting, you know, and well, so well, let me tell you, how do we, how do we things, reach those things, people? That's things the are, real problem. Things are a lot worse, okay? New York Times still is successful, lots of money. Jeff Bezos bought the Post, still doing great. That's two newspapers out of 1,400. The rest of them are doing lousy. The yeah. 350 reporters and editors are now 35, and they just laid off no, six more. But you're avoiding my question. They're, that's happening yeah. because the number of us who even bother to read those sources is diminishing. That's there's true, a, too. There's a, there's a, <coughs> right. The big problem is this whole generation that's getting their news from social media, right? okay? And, you know, they're going to be voting and making decisions. I mean, you know, most of us in this room, even with the deficiencies of the current news media, can manage to sort things out. Yeah, you can, absolutely. But that's... What do we do, what do, we do about... Yeah, you try that one, because I have no answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I don't, I, I don't know if you can figure out which came first, the chicken or the egg, but because of the internet, advertising... Um, revenues diminished enormously for newspapers. That meant then that they had to lay off staff. That meant then that they didn't have interesting enough news and a big enough newspaper for people. You know, what's the point in subscribing anymore? Um, so you've got this sort of snowballing effect that is really, John used to work, live and work in Gloucester for what was then a great newspaper in the 80s called the Gloucester um, Times. We have moved back now 30 years later and it's painful to read it. And this was one of the great local newspapers. Um, reporters from it came out of there and went on to any number of great newspapers themselves. But a lot of them stayed because it was rewarding to work that way. So, so the effect on particularly local democracy um, isn't just because young people aren't reading it. My, um, and and um, be, it's very much because the entire business model has changed. Um, the ability to do bad things is much um, greater than the ability to do good things. Um, and so we're in a bad place right now. I will say that we were part of a movement that started about 12 years ago called um, the Nonprofit Investigative News Movement. They have an organization called INN, Independent Nonprofit News. And we, th these were organizations started by essentially refugees from the good news business who couldn't bear working in the bad news business anymore. And we got foundation funding, essentially the, the nonprofit public radio model, and um, found our way with limited resources. And you know, I had to learn how to write HTML for our website, which my kids think is an amazing miracle. And you know, with a small budget, 
do the kind of journalism that wasn't being done anymore. So there are attempts to do this. Um, and it's happening on a smaller scale, not a larger scale, but almost every state has one of these groups. Um, you're not going to get daily stories out of it, but there is the a kind of accountability reporting that you need as citizens to hold your government accountable. Yeah, but you didn't answer my basic question. No, we didn't. Basic but the answer to the question is, well, young people aren't, you're saying young people aren't reading the news, so that's bad for news. And what can we do about it? Pro they, they, here it is. They are reading the news, but they don't know they're reading the news. I no, talk to them all the time. They're, they're, not, they're not using the traditional news source. They are, but they don't know they are. Yeah, so, so my son's friend um, who works for the Boston Globe says, and they're, he's 30, says, none of my friends read the Boston Globe. And I said to him, do they listen to public radio out of Boston, GBH or BUR? He said, oh yeah, all of them do. I said, so they're reading the Boston Globe. Because every public radio newsroom in the morning gets the local paper and that sets the agenda for the stories they do. So that's the, they're reading Well, it, they're, they going to, they're going to Facebook and someone says, read something, and they say, where'd you get your news from, Joe, on Facebook? Well, there was a link to the, to the Seattle Times. Yeah. So they yeah. are getting it from what you talk about, what you talk about, but they don't realize that where they're getting it from. And there is no monetary value to the originator of that source, the Seattle Times, just to make up one. And so that's, that's, that's part of the problem. And I think that this interest in politics is getting young people to check out the news, but they're checking out in totally different ways than we are, and it's not accruing a lot of benefit to the actual uh, uh, originators of the news. Yeah, but the, al the algorithms that are, sure, they're, they click to yeah. the Seattle Times, yeah. but the algorithms that are used to click are self-confirming algorithms, so they don't get a spectrum. They can, they can, absolutely, right. More questions at this point, ma'am. So I, I almost never write the editor, but I wrote the editor twice this morning. And um, so in Vermont, we have, um, it was about two different uh, articles. Uh, one was about uh, a bill that died be that had to do with um, mar secondhand smoke for marijuana, and another had to do uh, with a guy who was high on marijuana and killed five kids a year and a half ago on I-89 and how they're going to uh, uh, dismiss it because of reasons of insanity. And I just went through the roof. It, it just brought up all this stuff for me, again, around how so many, such a large percentage of our population, especially the young people, are not getting factual information about the new marijuana, 100% THC, that's out there and what's happening in Colorado. We, the older generation has more information, but the young generation has a really gets a lot of it from what you're saying is this, uh, there's a lot of money behind this new uh, industry that's coming out that's all about you know, edibles and whatnot, not about flour at all anymore. And it's the downside of that just isn't being reported. At both of those, none of, there wasn't any reference in the entire article to you know, Colorado has the highest number of kids being poisoned, uh, the, you know, what secondhand smoke is. There was no investigation into that. And on the one about the kids being killed on the highway because the guy was PTSD this and doesn't have anything with, to do with this topic. With, it does because the, there there was no mention that marijuana is associated when it's associated with PTSD with increased you know mental illness and I never see that reported. Yeah, I think I think news. what you're talking about is um, actually it is it is connected to this issue, which is how does public policy get made, and public policy gets made by people is at the state house over there and citizens coming in and saying this is what you have to pay attention to and it then is also advocacy groups who come in and these marijuana advocacy advocacy groups are it's not about compassionate care it's about money and we saw this in Maine you've seen it here it was in Colorado it's in California it is an enormous money making industry that hires the most polished lobbyists and it may be a good cause it may not but the legislators who at least in most places don't become specialists on these things get completely snowed by the um, effort that is galvanized by these groups and so where do newspapers fit in there? They have to be in there saying what is actually real as this goes on. But for a reporter who has to cover one or two reporters in the Statehouse covering something, um, they're not going to have the time to do a research project. 
Um, they may rely on people like you to get in touch with them and say, you know, I notice your coverage doesn't have this perspective and this kind of information. I'd love to sit down with you for half an hour or just send you some material and go through it with you so that you can be more informed about this. So it is a very, and, and more and more we saw this, I covered the Maine State House for 16, 17 years, and over those years I watched the um, industrialization of um, lobbying happen, where more and more lobbying groups um, came together, um, high-priced lobbyists, they then organized, um, what's it called, astroturfing, where they would get um, folks to, to send letters and cables and you name it and show up and have, and they were paid to do this and, and without a newspaper to puncture some of the stuff that happens around those kinds of efforts, you can have bad policy made or policy that is not in the public interest. So. I'm hoping you'll speak just a little bit to the, the monthly or the weekly magazines that are out there and what news, in my opinion, doing long-term investigative stuff. You've got seven days here that's done some really great work. Yeah. yeah. And also speak if you could just quickly to the idea of false equivalencies and how often those are showing up. As, as though. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, well, I know about seven days. I, there are other, other magazines. I don't know what, sure, Atlantic I'm Monthly. I'm thinking of Vanity Fair. For example. Vanity Fair is just some great stuff. Uh, Atlantic New Monthly, York. New Yorker. Recently. Right. Um, yeah. Many of them do have a bias. You ought to be aware of what they may be. They're really well reported and well written, but I kind of know where they stand politically uh, and what you know what their readers want to hear and what the readers don't want to hear. So I have a little bit of um, skepticism I apply to those places when I read their pieces. Um, and the other question was, well, well yeah, yeah, this is something that uh, no, so and so said the Earth is round. I got to find someone that says it's flat mm -hmm. uh, because you know, that's, that's, yeah, we, we've tried to. The business got caught up in that some time ago because it created its own problem by not listening to people with opposing point of views at all because they thought they were yahoos. Can and you define false equivalency? For you false equivalency is when, um, when we have uh, somebody at a city council meeting who says that uh, we, we think that the, you know, that the, uh, that, uh, I think of an example, uh, that the tax rates are too high. And th here's the reasons why, and it gives you six good reasons. And you say, the editor says, well, you know, you better find somebody who says the tax rates are too low. So find someone who doesn't know anything about tax rates to give you that point of view. I don't care if he's a jerk or knows nothing, he made up in the street. But we at least have two points of view in it. So one's informed and intelligent and backup stuff. Other one is just anybody who says the opposite point of view. So that's false equivalency. If you can't find someone who actually knows something about the tax rate, then you shouldn't be quoting them. And we, we did that because of the complaints, mostly complaints from conservatives who said the papers were too liberal. And at that point, they were, had, had a point of view, probably were, it was a bias. And to fix the bias, we went overboard by getting people with any point of view that's the opposite point of view. And I think people have actually now recognized that. And I don't believe that's happening quite as much. In my opinion, the Rachel Maddow, Sean Hannity was a false equivalent. So that's my opinion. Yeah, well, there are examples of. of Maybe Rush of, Limbo, you know, Rush right. Limbo would have been more obvious. But than, than, than Sean Hannity? Yeah, Sean Hannity. Yeah. 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 I don't, I haven't seen him that much, but I'm pretty sure I know what he's like. <laughs> but he's not. I see. Is it a full seat of Rachel Maddow? Might have been Rush Limbaugh, you think? Would have been. More equivalent? <laughs> no, no, it would have been more obvious. More obvious, okay. Okay. We'll fix that one. We could keep them going all. All right, one I'm more. I'm so sorry, but I had my hand up. Right okay. From the get -go. My question, especially to you, Naomi, is you hit the nail on the head. We've got to speak up and tell these news organizations what we want. I've noticed that NPR, although they're reporting a little more to the right, you should hear the slant and the tone of the voice from when it's more a little left-leaning. I actually heard a reporter say twice, I never heard of this term before and I haven't heard it in a while, but twice, that something she was reporting on was a nothing burger. Oh. I've never heard of this slang oh, before. Oh, that's terrible. Anyway, please tell us in NPR, since a lot of us are VPR listeners, to which department or to which person do we The news director. Complain? The news director. Okay. And, and have a CC to 
the president of the organization. Okay, because when I heard that, I said to my husband, you should hear the tone of voice. Yeah, and also it will um, carry a lot, it'll carry a lot more weight if you say, I've been a member for 30 yes, years. And I am okay, and I support you, but I am concerned about what is going on with your news, um, news broadcast, news product, news, you know, whatever. Which and one, to VPR or to NPR? Uh, no, VPR. Uh, the, the VPR, you know, all the state ones are affiliates of yes. the national one. Uh, they pay money to the national one to get the programs, but they're managed locally. Now, they're not responsible for the national content that they feature. So you complain to them if it's one of their reporters. If it's an NPR reporter, then you go to NPR. Okay. Thank you. I want to thank you. We could yes. probably go on all Forever. afternoon yeah. here. <laughs> but, but thank you so much, John and Naomi. Thank you.